Hey everybody, thanks for checking out MeetingPlace.tv. This is your weekly broadcast. This week I'm coming to you from a little town called Berry Hill, which is considered the crossroads of Music City. And one thing that stuck out to us about this specific place, not only is it just a couple miles from downtown Nashville, but as you can see behind me, there's many portraits and paintings of famous artists and musicians from over the years. You know, just in this one block area, there's one, two, three, four, five different fences that are painted with many, many popular and famous people from over the years. And just also in this little block, there's one, two, three, four, five different recording studios. It's pretty neat how when you come to the music city capital or the music capital of the world, how many people are involved in this industry. When I think back at each individual artist, it really blows my mind to think about what they must have done to achieve what they achieved. And that's kind of what I wanna to talk to you about this week. When we look at the Bible, there's two stories that kind of parallel each other in one specific way, Old Testament and New Testament. First, let's look at this Old Testament story. Now, God brought the children of Israel or the Hebrews out of slavery, out of Egypt with Moses. Moses led them out of Egypt, led them through the Red Sea, led them towards the Promised Land. And we know the story because they did not want to proceed into the promised land. They waited 40 years and wandered in the desert for 40 years. And eventually when the new generation came, they went into the promised land with Caleb and Joshua. I specifically want to point out how the Hebrew people or how God's children reacted and responded to different scenarios in their life. Whenever they came up against hardships, whenever they came up against troubles, whenever they came up against circumstances that were difficult, how did they act? How did they respond? Well, the first thing, if you remember, when they came up to the Red Sea, even though they had supernatural provision up to that point, cloud by day, fire by night, when they got to the Red Sea and Pharaoh and his army was behind them, they felt entrapped. They felt like they were going to die. And what's the first thing they say? We were better off in Egypt. We were better off in slavery. At least we had something to eat. At least we were taken care of because it got difficult. The first thing I want to point out, just because it gets difficult, that's not an excuse to run back to how things used to be. That's not an excuse to run back to the known instead of taking a step of faith into the unknown. Right after they go through the Red Sea, we see again, they get to the desert and they begin to complain. They go to the promised land. They see the, the giants of, of Canaan. And what do they do? They say, we were like grasshoppers in their eyes. We are just as if there's no way that we could possibly go up against them. When they sent out the spies, only two came back and said that we could do it, Joshua and Caleb. And that, those are the people who led the next generation into the promised land. That's the second thing I want to point out. If you want to lead where you've never led before, the first step is having the mindset that you can do it. You can do all things through Christ. He is the one that propels you. He is the one that prepares you. And he is the one that can catapult you into the next season and into that promised land when you believe that he can do what he said he will do. That's the second thing. Now, even though they didn't go that first time and they wandered around in the wilderness, God still provided for them. Provided manna, provided quail, when the rivers were bitter, they provi God provided a way for the rivers to be sweet, the water to be sweet so they would have something to drink, but yet they still complained. I got to thinking, you know why they complained? It wasn't necessarily because they weren't being provided for. It was because they did not know what was next. In other words, they didn't have security. They didn't have the sense of comfort and knowledge of what was to come step by step, day by day, decision by decision. So what did they do? They complained, they went to Moses, they went to Aaron and they said, it would be better for us to go back into slavery, go back to the enemy's camp, go back into the hands of the enemy, go back into Egypt, because at least we had food, at least we know what the next day looks like. I want to encourage you this, this is the third point from this Old Testament piece. Just because you don't know what security looks like in the new season, just because you may not be taken care of 
like you used to does not mean that God won't provide. The Bible said that He is our provider. He is our protector. He is the one who comes alongside and guides and leads and directs. He is the one who does that. It's not us. It's not our own makings. Although we can provide for ourselves, He's the one who takes it to that next level. He's the one who walks with us as we take steps of faith and we trust in Him fully. He's the one who does that. And I think a lot of time in today's world what happens is we deny ourselves the ability to take steps of faith because we don't know what the, it looks like. But I would say this, if we knew what it looks like, what would be the faith? If we knew what the next day held, where's the trust in God? If we knew what the next season already looked like, if we knew what the end result already looked like, where would be the trust in that? Where would be the faith in that? God says, trust me, see what I will do, put your faith in me. That is where the key lies, putting our faith in God when He tells us to do something. Even though we may not know exactly where perhaps the next meal is coming from, perhaps the next paycheck is coming from, God says this, He says, when I tell you to go to point A, point B, point C, when I tell you to go into the promised land, if I've told you to do it, I've told you it's yours, that's where you head towards, that's the direction you go. I will provide, I will protect, I will be the one who comes alongside. Remember, the Israelites, it was a different thing, but God still provided for them. It was the security of the matter. Let me challenge you this. If you're more concerned about your security than you are your relationship with the Lord and where you're at in your faith, you may want to re-examine that because the Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. So we have to be a people who trust in the Lord and what He tells us to do and how He tells us to do it. So that's kind of the first point of this message this week is dissecting that story of God's people, the Israelites and Moses, and how they responded and how they reacted to different circumstances. Let's look at a New Testament story. So the second part of this, I wanna come from the New Testament. I specifically wanna look at the disciples. Now the disciples, Jesus called them out one by one from what their daily jobs were, what their career was. He pulled them out. We know that Peter was a fisherman and Jesus calls him out and says, come follow me. And I think it's absolutely amazing. And you got to think about the anointing. Obviously, there was a calling on his life and the spirit of the Lord that must have been on Jesus in that moment for them to leave everything and follow him. And not only follow him, but to live with him for three years. And so who better to tell you about Jesus, to preach the gospel, than people that live with him for three years? And so we know a lot of the gospel story. Eventually, after going through and doing his ministry, Jesus dies on the cross. He resurrects, and after he resurrects, he actually meets with the disciples and appears to them three different times that we know of according to the book of John. He appears to some of the disciples in a room. Thomas is not there. And then, he, and then Thomas says, well, I'll believe it when I see it. I want to put my finger in the holes where the nails were in his hands and in his side. And then the next thing we read about is they're in a room again together, and Jesus kind of just appears out of nowhere and says, Thomas, I'm here. Stick your finger in my in the holes in my hand, stick your finger in the side where I've been stuck. So after Thomas, you know, sees that it's actually Jesus, perhaps he did put his finger in those wounds. Jesus says this, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who believe who have not seen. And that's the majority of the world today that are, that are believers and followers of Jesus. We haven't seen and, and Jesus calls us blessed. But here's what I wanted to pull out. The next part, the next time Jesus reveals himself to them, the Bible says that the disciples went back to fishing. Now that may not seem like a big deal to most of us. That may not seem like, okay, well they're fishing, big deal, they were hungry. But you gotta remember what they did before they encountered Jesus. Before the disciples encountered Jesus, the majority of them were fishermen. The majority of them fished in order to make a living, to make ends meet, to provide for their families. This is what the disciples did. And the Bible says they went right back to it. How many times when we are away from Jesus, how many times when we haven't experienced Him in a while, do we go right back to the things we used to do? How many times do we go right back to the things that we're secure about? How many times do we go right back to the things we used to do that used to make us money, that used to provide for us, that used to make ends meet? And we do that because it's what we know. I think it's natural for us to have some sort of fear of the unknown. And here, the disciples, specifically Peter, 
goes right back to what they did before they encountered Jesus, before they lived with him for three years, before Jesus taught them the kingdom, the principles of the kingdom, how to love each other the way you're supposed to be loved, how he laid down this new law. He came and fulfilled the law and he told them what it was all about. After that, they go right back to the life they had before they encountered him. Perhaps it was that Jesus wasn't walking with them anymore. Perhaps they were a little bit discouraged because they weren't with him every single day anymore. Perhaps that's what it was. Or perhaps they didn't realize, they didn't come to the conclusion, they didn't know what to do next. And so they just went right back to what they were doing. But I want to encourage you, just because you don't know the exact next step doesn't mean that you take eight steps backwards back to the old life you used to have before Jesus. They went right back to what they did before they knew him simply because there was a fear of the unknown, simply because Jesus wasn't there, simply because there wasn't a security in knowing what the next step was going to be. Here's the kicker. So they see a man far off on the shore and he says, have you caught anything? And they said, no, we haven't caught anything all night. He says, well, look, throw your nets on the other side. They throw their nets on the other side and the Bible says there's so much they could barely haul it in. Matter of fact, there's 153 fish. Their nets are full to the brim with fish. You know what that little nugget shows me? That shows me that when I try to go back to the life I had, when I try to go back to my old career, when I try to go back to the things that used to provide for me, when I try to go back to the known, when I try to go, go back to the thing that I think will bring me security, it's not going to be as fruitful as when I do it with Jesus. It's not gonna be as fruitful as when I do what Jesus tells me to do. It's not gonna be as fruitful as when I'm obedient to what Jesus says. Because when I'm doing what Jesus has called me to do, when I'm obedient to Jesus, I'm that much more fruitful, so much so I can't contain it. And that reminds me of the scripture that says, test me in this and see how I don't pour out the windows and the blessings that should flow from heaven. That, my friend, is how Jesus works, that when we step out in obedience, when we step out in faith, not necessarily knowing what's next, he blesses it and he honors it because we're stepping out in faith and trusting in him, not knowing what's next. I know a lot of people that say, well, if I just knew the next step or if I knew the end result, I could do this. Yeah, you could because that doesn't take faith. That doesn't take trust. What takes faith and trust is knowing that Jesus is who he says he is and standing on that. That's what takes faith. Not necessarily knowing the next step, not necessarily knowing which way the path will go, but just knowing that you can take God at his word because his promises according to scripture are yes and amen, or yes and let it be done. That's his promises. So here, Peter's in the boat. And when Peter's in the boat, he realizes when they're hauling in this fish, oh my word, that's Jesus on the shore. So he throws on his outer garment, he swims ashore about 100 meters, 100 yards or so. He gets there, Jesus has breakfast ready for everyone. And there's about 153 fish that they caught from these nets. Jesus breaks bread with them, he has a meal with them, he communes with them, he spends quality time with them, and then he pulls Peter away. And I can just imagine they begin to walk off, perhaps down the beach, and Jesus reconciles Peter because previously Peter had denied Jesus three times. And this time, Jesus doesn't say, why did you deny me? Jesus says this, which basically points to the intimacy factor, points to how much we love him. Jesus says this, do you love me? Peter says, yes, I love you. And then he says, feed my sheep. And that word love actually means a fiery love, a super compassionate love, a love that's so strong it compels you to act. That's the love that Jesus is talking about, a fiery, burning love for him. It's not just the, oh, I like you love. It's a fiery, burning, compassionate love that compels you to action. And that's the word phrasing that Jesus uses when he says, do you love me? It can literally be translated, Peter, do you have a fiery, compassionate love for me to do what I know you're called to do? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I do love you. Yes, Lord, I am fiery, compassionate. And you know what that should do? If we're fiery, compassionate about Jesus, that should lead us to feed the sheep, that should lead us to care for the flock, that should lead us to care for others, that should lead us to love for others and treat others the way we want to be treated, that should lead us to be compassionate towards others and help them out of the situation they're in, to help them be the, the people that God's called them to be. And then after this moment of reconciliation, when Jesus reconciles with Peter, we see that Peter, after he encounters Jesus again, he encounters the Holy Spirit, the church grows exponentially daily, not one or two daily, exponentially, 
thousands upon thousands added to the church daily because Peter encountered Jesus, walked out in faith, encountered the Holy Spirit, knew who he was and walked it out, trusted in God and walked that out. My question to you today, are there things that possibly you haven't stepped into? Are there, is there a calling? Is there a direction? Has God revealed something to you either through scripture, through the preaching of the word, through the teaching of the, of the word? Maybe someone came and shared something they thought the Lord put on their heart for you. Maybe it was a prophetic word. Maybe it was a word of knowledge. Maybe it was something the Lord showed you in a dream. Maybe you just feel real strongly about a certain topic or maybe you feel very strongly about a certain issue and you just can't shake it. Maybe that's the Lord saying, this is the direction I want you to step in. And maybe you just haven't done it yet. I want to encourage you to take steps of faith because if God has told you to do it, He will be there for you. He will provide for you. He will protect you. He will lead you. He will direct you. He will be the one who comes alongside, the Bible says, and helps us every step of the way. Don't go back to the old life. Don't just set it there and say, maybe one day. Now is the time. Now is the hour. And with Jesus, the Bible says, all things are possible. That's not some pie in the sky idea. The Bible says, with Jesus, all things are possible. If he's placed something in your heart, if he's spoken something to you that you know is him, you can trust him with it. You can believe on him and he will come through. You don't have to second guess. You don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. You don't have to say, well, how am I going to provide? Or how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? One step at a time, day by day, decision by decision, Jesus will come through. He will re reveal what you're supposed to do and he will be the one who helps you. Remember what happened in the boat. Peter and the disciples tried to do everything on their own. Zero fish, zero provision, zero blessing. They throw to the other side, being obedient to Jesus, and there's so much they can't contain it. Their nets almost rip. Remember what happened with the children of Israel? They wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back into slavery. They wanted to go back into the enemy's hands before God had delivered them. But what did God do? He still showed grace. He still showed mercy. He allows the people that don't believe in him to basically die off and he takes the ones who do believe and he says now we're going to where I promised you now we're going to where the promised land is that flows with milk and honey that has the blessing that has the provision that has my favor on it that's where we're going next and let's not forget the waters of the Jordan were held up as well and they had another miracle kind of like the Red Sea God will provide the miracle, He'll provide the blessing, He'll provide the breakthrough as long as you're obedient and do what He's called you to do and go where He's called you to go. Listen, my friend, the one reason why I'm so compassionate about this because I'm walking this out myself. I'm believing God myself for my family, for what He's called us to do. And so I can speak passionately about this. This is like a fire shut up in my bones. If I can challenge you today, is to don't listen to the naysayers around you. Don't listen to the mindset of, I don't know about that or I can't do that. That may be not for me. The Bible says that his promises for us are yes and amen. And the Bible says with Jesus, all things are possible. So all you simply have to ask yourself is this. Can I take Jesus at his word? Can I put my trust and faith in him fully? And if I can, get ready, my friend. Because if you can, he'll take you places you've never been before. And you'll do things you've never done before. Because that's how he works. Yes and amen. Yes and let it be done in Jesus' name. Well, I love you. Be encouraged. Be blessed. Listen to the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next time at meetingplace.tv. Are you feeling the Spirit of the Lord leading you to invest in the kingdom? We are honored that you would consider partnering with us to reach the world for Jesus. To donate to Meeting Place, simply follow the directions on the screen. Go to meetingplace.tv and click the Give tab or text GIVE to 786-504-7192. All donations to Meeting Place are tax deductible.